everybody. I hope we're all doing really well. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I will quickly introduce myself. My name is Charlotte. I am the owner of Boutique Rooms, which is a very small operation here in Cambridgeshire. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and th wait, thank you for waiting so patiently as well. Um, so just to do some very quick housekeeping before I introduce you to our wonderful panelists. Um, any questions that you have going on during the call uh, or the webinar, if you pop a queue in the chat box before your question at the end of the evening, we can uh, go through it. Uh, we're looking to do 50 minutes of content and then 20 minutes of Q&A. So do drop your questions in because we've got great people here tonight. Um, so let's get started. Please, Greg, sh please introduce yourself to everybody. Hey everyone, um, so I'm Greg Dorban. I'm CEO and founder of a accommodation agency called Comfy Workers. Um, and I also run a service accommodation management company called The Right Property Group. Um, and both of them are specialized in contractor and corporate housing bookings. So uh, basically hosting businesses for um, typically Monday to Friday, but over a number of weeks and months um, in various locations across the UK. Super, thank you so much, Greg. And Sean, uh, I think this is the first time we've ever met, so hello. <laughs> Please Good introduce yourself. Afternoon, yes, this is the first time that we've met. Um, my name's Sean Rakijic. Uh, I am an operator of about 100 properties, um, initially on the Airbnb platform, but we've gone multi-channel, um, and we've used Zebu as our uh, channel manager for our rollout for our multi-channel campaign. Um, I also have a YouTube channel uh, called Airbnb Automated, where I've given about the last three and a half years to teaching how I've built my business along the way from about 10 units, I think is how many I had when I did my first video to 100 units, um, right ballpark 100 units. Now we, we broke the 100 unit mark about January 2020. So we've been big for a while. And that's me. So hi, and thanks for having me. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. So everybody that's here tonight on the webinar is probably looking on how to attract business travellers to their short term rental. And I'm sure both Sean and Greg and the rest of you, whether you are not in serviced accommodation or you are, you know that the market has been a tote, has had a flip on its head last year um, with the pandemic. And I, what I have found personally as a host, uh, that leisure obviously dipped away and we had a lot of business. Um, but what I think would be really good is, uh, Greg, because your business is contractors, business travellers, corporate, I think what would be really good for us who are more towards the leisure side of things is what would be the main benefits of getting into the business market, uh, business travelers versus leisure hosts, uh, leisure market. And why do you think it's important for us to, let's say, go into the business um, travel market? Great question, Charlotte. So we're probably um, in a typical year, excluding the last 12 months, um, about 80% business bookings um, compared to leisure. Our, our locations mean that when we do get leisure bookings, it's typically weddings, anniversaries, graduations, like family celebrations. Um, there's very few, what I would say is like pure leisure and tourism where you're just going there because you want to have fun. You've typically got a reason to go there. Um, so what, what that means is our, our benefit of focusing on businesses is our client value can typically be into the, into the thousands. Um, instead of having someone that books for a weekend or a week and now a one-time visit, um, because that's what typically leisure guests do, or maybe at best they visit like once a year, we'll have a client that will book once, but then they will basically return for weeks or months in the same property or even need more people in the same house. So it, it means that not that automation is not important, but it's a lot it's easier to scale because you're managing less relationships um, typically less complexity around turnovers and bed changes, um, and you don't have as much seasonality. Um, so yes, we do have seasons in, in like contractor markets, but they're nowhere near as extreme as they are with, with leisure and tourism markets. So we're, we, we have good occupancy all year round. 
um, what we typically see is the rates change more during summer and um, summer and winter, um, or typically like spring and summer are strong, and then autumn and winter are, are weaker. But the occupancy stays relatively consistent all year round. Sean, anything to add to that? I 100% agree with the constant clients and what I found when with my side of the bookings, because I've got a 50-50 split, I'd say half leisure and then half contractor market. And what I found with the contractor market, especially over the pandemic, is that they wouldn't just come once, it would be repeat, 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 and, and not necessarily um, the stays were getting longer as well. So the projects were extending and so on. I don't know if that was the same or similar in the US for your clients, Sean. Yeah, so what I can add to that is if we're talking about why you want like business travelers, um, we tend to have, they, they tend to stay longer, which allows us to have more properties at scale running. Uh, we try to keep at least 30% of our listings on month to month stays or better. And a majority of those tend to be business travelers. And what's cool about getting direct bookings with business travelers, people you know that come back, um, is they are they are less actually concerned on the seasonality prices. If you get somebody who is comfortable with you, trusts you, um, and is booking your property at say a certain rate um, in a prime season, you're much more likely to get a better relative price in your low season compared to it because they're not looking to go and beat you up on price to move to one of your competitors. Um, as long as you accommodate them lightly in the fact that it is, you know, you recognize that they should get a smaller like price that they pay, like, but you can kind of give them a menial change in price instead of having to drop down a competitive, people will pay that premium over competitive to stay with you in a slow market. So you actually do get better revenues on your return guests uh, that way. For sure, 100% agree with that. Uh, just a quick break. I would like to introduce Donna, our final panelist. Um, so Donna, hello. Please uh, let us know who you are, where you're from, and uh, yeah. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, everyone. First of all, apologies for the lateness, a bit of a connection issue. Um, so yeah, my name is Donna O'Sullivan, and I'm an account manager with Expedia. Some of you might be familiar. If you're not, um, we're an online travel agency. Um, we do have a corporate brand as well that you may or may not have heard of called Agencia. So to Agencia, we deal solely with the corporate business client. Um, I'm an account manager for the UK and Ireland, so I'd look after all the self-catering accommodation across the whole of the UK and Ireland. I've been with the company for five years now, so happy to share any insights I can that you might find helpful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, Greg, from, from what you were saying is that you're, because of your market, you've managed to keep your head above water, I assume, during this time, during the pandemic. Um, do you think this has helped all businesses? Has the, this particular market in the travel industry particularly helped corporate and uh, maybe leisure even survive and get through this because I'm I'm sure you've seen um, a load of operators are no longer with us or no longer operating and I think it would be good to know how this kind of business helped your company survive. Yeah so I, I think on that for what we've seen is it's drawn more attention towards business bookings in the first place. Um, the, the, I would say um, we actually run a webinar and a poll probably six months ago, and um, a quarter of, of people attending were almost exclusively business and contractor bookings. Um, a quarter were no business and contractor bookings, and then there was like 50% in the middle, and uh, that do like 50-50. And I think what we've seen is having minimal like occupancy with business bookings with contractors meant that people in even leisure locations can weather out the the last 12 months we've been through because with the restrictions we've faced it, it's either you open up to businesses which is essential traveling key workers and and other guest types that you may not traditionally take or you had absolutely no income at all so i, I think it's definitely meant a lot more operators have focused in on this this sector um, 
I think it'll be really interesting over the next six months as whether some people start to shift back because we get like staycations and leisure market and it bounces back. But it's it is definitely been like a lifeline for a lot of operators. And I think the ones that had good relationships going into um into lockdown here in the UK, similar to what, what Sean said, is the repeat guests will come back. Um, they trust the relationships, their their rates will be um typically more beneficial than people booking. Um, through OTAs in some instances, and you also don't pay the OTA commission once you have that relationship with them. So it, it's been like a lifeline for a lot of, of operators and the ones that were quicker to move towards it or already there, I think, have found it a lot easier to, to continue operating throughout this. Donna, do you have anything to add? Um, consider, again, your business very focused on the corporate market um again did people was it difficult or was it area focused where some areas were doing really well with business and other like operators really struggled getting the business through the door how was that yeah so I suppose just to echo what Greg said well for for me being an account manager you know I'm, lo I'm looking at kind of all sides of the card so we'd have like I'm dealing with a lot of leisure business it'd be mainly leisure and then the corporate side for us in a primary corporate market, such as London, for example, would be maybe 18 to 20 percent. Now, we have a very different model. So our maximum length of stay is 28 days. So we wouldn't be month to month corporate or anything like that. It's a short term um, corporate guest that we would accommodate. So generally like an average length of stay of about seven days. Um, what I have seen is like there's no there's been no leisure mar um, travel in any of my markets across the UK and Ireland for since quarter four started Q4 last year, um, most of the market's locked down completely. So it's been the corporate business that has definitely helped keep it afloat where possible. Um, unfortunately, not everybody was able to stay afloat, but sorry, I think you're trying to say something. Oh, you? yeah, I'm not. I'm muted. Sorry about that, guys. Um, what about those hosts who were typically leisure to you? Did they adapt? Did they move over? Did some just say we're just shutting the doors? Did they change to the market or how was that? Definitely a mixed bag. And um, unfortunately, there was a lot of doors shut. Um, you know, that's been a common trend and continues, unfortunately. But then a lot of leisure. Um, tried to zone in on the on the corporate but I mean the corporate guests needs although some align with the leisure there's some are very different um so I mean it's not the, the properties that were solely leisure before wouldn't find it all find very easy to adapt to to the corporate market um it depends on the market really you know they they can try and zone in on corporate business but if it's not there it's not there in many cases unfortunately and Sean, what about over the pond? How did that look? How did that change for you guys? So uh, let me first just tell you that, of course, most of my business is in Texas. Um, it probably has a global reputation for freedom. Um, don't tell us what to do. Uh, we essentially never closed, right? We did have restrictions. Uh, I remember for two months, like I had to wear my mask and walk to the grocery store and come back home. And like there's, we did kind of quarantine for a little while, but uh, basically what, what, what shut down, right? What quarantine has been kind of our thing. So, um, we've done really strong, uh, with, uh, with the whole COVID thing as a state and major cities, uh, because there's, the travel is still happening. There's still a lot of like leisure and business travel, but there's even more like regional tourism, um, because Texas has been so friendly and there's people who want to get out of their states and out of their cities that are like more boring. And obviously you see in the housing market too, people are moving from California and New York now because uh, people are perceiving California to be less friendly um, long-term. And they're like, you know, I just, we, we need to, we need to live. So people are coming to Dallas and Austin and moving. So uh, for a for majority of my portfolio, we haven't really had to worry so much. Um, but Philadelphia um, is probably the market that's gotten hit hardest where we have a presence in. Um, and it's actually still, um, there's still a great, a good lull to that um, part. And Philadelphia is largely a tourism market for us uh, because, you know, people travel to Philly because it's one of the oldest cities in the country and there's a lot of history there. Um, so we've had to switch more to, uh, our strategy was switched more to monthly tenants. Um, even people who are local, who are just like, maybe they don't know if they want to move into a new property, but they let their leases end and they move in with us and pay by the month for something furnished. Um, that's been a lot of what we've done. 
Um, we haven't really gone corporate in the Philadelphia market, um, but that's because I don't have a personal presence there. Uh, we're doing a lot more experimentation in Texas because I'm here and can help with that. So um, I can talk later about like how we get corporate stays in kind of unique ways later. But um, yeah, here across the pond, um, we've definitely had less of um, like that dire situation. I think a lot of operators have had in, in Europe and like in, in parts of Asia as well. Let's actually talk about the um, how you've been attracting um, and with those guests as well. What it, have you changed any of your marketing strategies? And what did if if you have what was more beneficial and or not or did it not help at all? Yeah, sure. Um, we do a lot of active prospecting. So uh, one of the truths I think we all around the world can share is who's choosing to travel for work or for pleasure is changing. Um, COVID has affected people's lifestyles and their livelihood. Uh, it's, it's affected businesses' business models. So people who usually sent people to different cities to work aren't anymore. But then there's certain industries that have an uptick of travel. Obviously, like we can tell like traveling nurses or medical professionals tend to get dispatched more. That's like one example, but one of only many. Um, so like here in Dallas, um, I'll send a, a sales agent out to do a route, just drive through areas that are nearby where we have property and they find a road crew doing construction or somebody working on a new building or something. And they stop and they introduce themselves and say, hi, my name's Sean. Can I speak with your foreman? Uh, and the foreman is like the lead for the job. And there's always supposed to be a foreman on site with any construction. And then the foreman comes out and we introduce ourselves and say, hi, I'm part of a corporate housing, uh, you know, furnished accommodations company. Um, I imagine that you have people in town for these, these jobs, these contracts that you have. Um, I would like to uh, offer your, you know, your company better accommodations than you're staying in currently, possibly at the same price, maybe even less. Um, should I be speaking to you or maybe a project manager on this um, in order to like, you know, give you guys a proposal for some accommodations for you. And so now we're prospecting businesses on their job sites. Um, and the reason why this is effective is sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, what businesses have upped their, uh, their activity right now, right? So there are businesses that have lowered their activity to save costs. Um, there's some businesses that are taking advantage of the changes in the market and have increased their activity in order to like, of course, like grow their business through COVID. And it's hard to like go online and say, which companies are doing better during COVID and who can I try to sell my service to? So we're looking for very clear signals of business activity. And if we see an uptick of business activity, construction is an obvious example. We go and we actively prospect them um, and ask for the sale. And it goes really well. Um, that's great, actually. Um, shame that we probably wouldn't have worked in the UK with all these lockdown and COVID police and all of that. Um, so how did we do it, guys? Donna and Greg, please share your thoughts. Um, so similar to that, we it does work if you approach sites. Um, it's not something we do very often, though, to be honest, but I, I know a lot of people do, and it, it definitely does work. Um, a lot of ours is based, I touched upon earlier, is around like lifetime value. So once you've attracted the, the right type of, of guest and uh, basically booking the right type of company, it's really understanding their needs and their requirements and, and looking after them. So there's so much more in here that's around like customer relationship than there is just marketing off the bat like you would when you're looking at typically more leisure bookings. And the other big shift on this is um, looking at how uh, sort of behavior is of people booking. Um, so if you've got a small subcontractor, they'll typically be booking last minute on a phone um, that really value like price and be very, very price sensitive. Um, or you will have uh, someone that's probably from a slightly larger company that will be within like a head office type role um, and they'll be booking on behalf of their team. Um, they're less price sensitive and they're more about really understanding their needs um, and the amenities that your properties offer. So it, it's about how you advertise online, be it through OTAs or directly, of really highlighting the amenities that would be, be important to workers because they're not looking for the leisure or the experience aspects of the stay. Um, they're not looking for what sites it's near. They'll be looking for things like good access to transport links, distance to sites, um, how the beds are going to be arranged, an area where they can sit in the communal area where they're going to spend time, especially with everything shut in lockdown. So they're, they're looking for how their, their stay will work from a functional work perspective. Um, so your marketing really needs to be built around that rather than um, all the things you would appeal if you're, you're looking for leisure and tourism and, and the experience around it. Um, 
Anna, do you have anything to, to add on to that? Yeah, I suppose for for our company, um, we wouldn't have changed the market and as such, I suppose, just to give you an overview, um, we would have, I, Agencia is a separate brand to Expedia, so I work for Expedia and Agencia is our sister over there, and we would have sales managers globally who are actively um, signing up companies, hundreds of thousands of companies across the world um, to use Agencia as their travel desk, so if there's an employee, you know, looking for accommodation anywhere, they'd log in with a username and password. So it's not a marketing um, strategy per se. We would, the, the customers are already there for Agencia, um, whether their, their company, their travel sec section decides to sign up and use Agencia. But I suppose just to echo what Greg said, um, what we would be telling, what I'd be telling my account if they're trying to attract the, someone's already on the Agencia platform to, I suppose, different, differentiate themselves from the competition. It's, they're not as price sensitive a corporate client. So um, they're not looking for the best value at the lowest rate. What they're looking for is, you know, a property that manages their expectations, good content. Um, they can see what they're going, the accommodation is going to be like when they get there. Good post-stay reviews are really important um, and reviews that are responded to, whether they're negative or positive. Um, just, just to show there's good communication with the property provider. And then obviously the proximity to where they need to be, um, you know, all the, the things Greg mentioned there as well. Flexibility is quite important as well, we noticed. So um, for a corporate booker, they really want a 24 hours cancellation policy maximum um, on our platform. If it's any more restrictive than that, they won't book. So they're kind of the most important things that, that we're seeing, trends we're noticing. Which actually brings me beautifully to my next question. Um, speaking of trends, uh, I know that you said uh, you spoke about amenities, Greg, and you know that's what good access to main roads, what the bed settings are, and things like that. But as a result of the pandemic, do you think your corporate guest uh, avatar um, is changing their uh, buying behaviour or expectations in uh, what they want from us as hosts? Yeah, definitely. I think Donna touched upon the big one is flexibility. Um, that's been a huge shift over, uh, I'd say probably the last six months, more so than the first six months of lockdown, but definitely that uh, over the recent months that flexibility has been, been the big thing that we've seen. Um, as part of that flexibility, I think it's like partnership and understanding and, and empathising with their challenges as well, because as an industry, we've obviously had a hard time. Um, but equally, a lot of the, the clients haven't exactly had an easy ride as well. And understanding where they do have last minute changes of people and coming and going and um, positive tests and self-isolation and all of these change of plans, someone that really understands that and can help them navigate and take the pain, that's definitely become more important. Um, and then the other trend that I've seen definitely, definitely over the, the past couple of quarters is people look for separate rooms. So within, let's say, more contractor rather than corporate type bookings, um, before it would be they could they would happy to have twin rooms, two workers, separate beds. Whereas the vast majority of clients we work with now, I'd say probably 80% upwards are single person in a room. Um, there are some signs that's starting to, to change with confidence, but I think they've had so many sites locked down and so many jobs cancelled um, and they just want to be acting as a like an appropriate in this environment and protecting the bubble as much as they can. Um, that is a single worker to a room. So that's that's something that's definitely different to 12 months ago where four people in a double bedroom would be absolutely fine, whereas now it's it's rarer than normal that we're, we're seeing four people in a two bedroom apartment. It's typically two now. And how is that like on your business? Uh, because I have also noticed that whereas I used to be able to get more contractors in my four beds, now I can only have four guests. How are you finding uh, that change, especially on your apartments? Because I guess your apartments can sleep four, six if it's a two bed. Or, uh, how has that changed for your profit? Uh, and you know, just overall, how have you filled those as well? smaller margins if i'm honest where it's they will have a per person per budget typically um and they won't necessarily double the budget because they can only put one person in a room so they may increase it slightly because they are expecting more but they typically won't double the budget so it, again it's working out what you can do as a as a partner of theirs how you operate a, 
benefit them in terms of um, can you sell them seven days a week instead of four because they may want to stay because there's nothing to do when they go back home anyway. And it's, it's these type of things where you say, well, actually, I, I can help you in this way, but you need to help me in, in other ways. And it's really working out exactly what, what they need um, and how then you can make that work for you. So it's, it's definitely hit margins a lot um, because we don't have weekend leisure to top it up and things like that. So it's just working out what the rights um, the right solution is, and it's different for uh, for all of them, really. Donna, Sean, I would love to hear your uh, thoughts on have your guests changed since the pandemic, and what are their new requirements, and what is the difference in their buying behaviour? Let me jump in. Um, so, uh, what we found, obviously, because the US is like veered from baseline a little less. Um, we're, we find a lot of our corporate clients are actually people who are self-employed or they get reimbursed um, from their companies. So a lot of they self prospect, like the company doesn't have like a directive necessarily says this is what we need for our people. Um, the people staying there tend to still be the voice of the traffic. Um, so they're doing a lot, obviously a lot more work from home, work remote. So internet connectivity has been important. Having a quiet place to do meetings like this has been important for them as well. Um, they want to, um, have a spot that they know they can set up their computer, have a background that they can be happy with, um, and be able to you know, work from the from the computer. Um, for families that are traveling that work, they want um, things that can help them keep their kids occupied while they're working from home. Um, that's been ha helpful for family travelers that obviously are traveling for work and are corporate. Um, I would say, what else have we noticed has been kind of fun with our travelers as of late? Um, People are generally staying longer. Um, they are booking more last minute, but that's only because the market is like sifting kind of quickly and people are like are getting permission to travel last minute. And that's why we're seeing more last minute travel. I think that's actually gonna be a very short phase here in the States as things start to like ramp up, we're gonna start seeing people booking further and further in advance. But right now people are like, okay, you're clear to go do some stuff. Let's get out of town like in three days, right? So our calendars are, are filling up more, more quickly there. Um, people really aren't so like really concerned on price or anything, but they are leaning more towards um, the, the amenities that allow them to settle in. So they want to know that they've got a washer and dryer in the unit, um, that they can do all the stuff that they would do in their normal home because um, a lot of these people have open-ended kind of reasons that they're gonna be in the city. If business is going well, they're gonna stay, but people are really on, a lot of people are by the seat of their pants right now. So that's why, you know, Greg really spoke to flexibility. Um, people want to know that they can settle in and have the option to like dig in and stay if they decide that this is going to be their home away from home as they work. Thank you so much, Sean. Don Donna, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, I think the guy has really covered everything. Yeah. And for us, um, I mean, I we have a different, probably a different kind of corporate traveler. Um, what I have noticed is just a general shift towards self-catering accommodation in general. So I mean, when I said like 20% of our share into somewhere like London could be corporate, you'd expect 18% of that 20 would be the, the hotel segment, whereas that's come back um, definitely in the last six months and the self-catering apartments and apart hotels and all this, you know, alternative accommodation type has, has increased. So it just speaks volumes the way Greg mentioned, you know, people aren't that willing to share a room. Um, some people aren't even that willing to share a hotel anymore you know they want their own apartment so that's just the way it's going and it's really interesting to see what it's going to be like in the second half of this year for us because I'd imagine it's vacation rental is growing as a segment across the board but for the corporate market I'd expect it to grow even further. You are on mute. See, I have an amazing panelist. They tell me when I'm useless of tech. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I guess my next question really ties into with uh, the last one as well. Um, I know, you, Greg, you mentioned so much about, you know, like uh, with the amenities, the flexibility, the single person per room and so on. How have businesses responded to these new trends? And is it possible that everyone could have responded and reacted um, to the, the new world, let's call it. 
I think on this one, let's let Donna go first because Sean and I have taken the last couple and, and left there with not much at the end. Donna, I swear I love you. It's, I don't know why. No, please do. Um, let us know what kind of trends have, uh, yeah, the trends that have happened. How have your hosts responded to this? I think it'll be interesting as well with your leisure um, guests, uh, well, hosts, how they manage to adapt to this new world. I suppose the main um, way they've had to adapt is just, you know, having their health and hygiene standards really, really visible on their websites um, and across all platforms. So we've noticed, you know, the main filters that are now used on air sites are not the traditional um, star rating or, you know, special offer. You're looking for some kind of value add. It's the health and hygiene filter and it's the cancellation policy filter. So that's the, the main two um you know, needs um, that need to be met by the hosts. So I think that our, our hotels, whatever it may be, they need to really um, be offering the flexibility that we've already covered and um, outlining exactly what they're doing to keep you safe when you're at the property. And, you know, there's a lot on air platform, there's a lot of different segments, um, I'm sure on all, every platform is different, but I think the more detail you can go into, the better to, you know, make, make it, any guests feel as safe as they can when they get there. So they're the, the, the only the two things that we've zoned in on kind of in the last 12 months is um, the flexibility and, and health and hygiene. So let's talk about the flexibility in terms of cancellation policy as well, because I think typically as a leisure host, we like that security. And I think we're very used to having, you know, that booking and that flexibility is, uh, I guess we're less flexible, so to speak. So how would, let's say, like a leisure host start to adapt with the flexible cancellation? Because for me, personally, I have a very strict policy um, on leisure. But when it does come to my, my contractor's house, yes, it is slightly uh, on the flexible side. But those who are mainly leisure hosts, how could they, you know, how could, would you, what would you say to them to make them feel more confident? Because that's a question definitely from me personally. Yeah, I think that um, you really need to know your market. Um, if, if it's, it's going to be a big shift for you going from, you know, being very restrictive with your cancellation policy to being very flexible. You know, know what's going on around you. It doesn't have to be last minute by any means, but you have to be um in the same ballpark as your competitors or you're just eliminating yourself from the customer's decision maker making um area altogether in my opinion so i mean some markets for, for, for vacation rentals for instance we're saying for for seven days really now is you know as restrictive as you you should be um for a corporate business traveler now for agency as i said earlier it's 24 hours but for a vacation rental leisure guest now we'd say seven days should be the max that you should have um if it's further out than that in air eyes you know there's just so much supply at the moment whether it be for hotels or for vacation rentals all the different segments um want the business so if you're going to be have if you're going to have a one month cancellation policy or a 21 day you're automatically eliminating yourself in in our opinion gents anything to follow with uh, the business trends that you've noticed and how businesses have responded to it um thank you for that donna by the way i think uh, a lot of hosts i think because of the way that the pandemic hit it came and we all freaked out and you know we'd have a lot of people booking and then now cancelling i think the new fear may possibly be actually in the leisure market where i don't know if a lot of you've seen it but the double booking scenario because of the flexible cancellation so how would a host in theory then protect themselves in that case because now we are all being flexible because we don't know how the market is going to match that but we're now losing that security as well so how does a again a leisure host feel more comfortable moving over to a business or maybe incorporating a little bit of a business mix for them yeah great great question um the, the double booking thing we, we've seen um starting to, to to occur throughout the summer um personally i'm not too worried about it based on i think that demand's going to be so high 
Um, even if like travel abroad is allowed, demand is going to be so, so high that if someone cancels, there'll be a lot of people that say, hey, let's go somewhere because we need to. Um, and our locations aren't like ideal for that, but I, I'm not too worried about having low occupancy this summer. If if we look at last year and last year was, let's say, survivable or OK, there's no way this year will be worse than last year. So it, on, on that sense, I'm not too worried about about those like cancellation pieces. I think from a host's point of view, um, I'd agree with Donna, it's about knowing your audience and your property itself won't need to change too much between leisure corporate and contractors like there's not huge differences they still value it to be typically modern they still value the amenities that you'll expect with with all types of travelers it's just the order of which ones are most important um and it's typically to do with who you're marketing to and how you're you're advertising to them. the the same property could be branded a listing a large house for um big families or weddings and you could have the same house, which is large house suitable for contractor groups. And you can advertise it exactly like the same property, but you're gonna focus on kitchen, living room, um, more features in the property. It might be a period property. I've, I've got one I know that's very period and attractive to like leisure guests like that. But then you look at contractors and they don't really care the kitchen, they just wanna know it's got one. They want to know there's a sofa and they want to know there's a TV with Netflix because they can't go anywhere else. And then they want to know the beds are clean and, and modern and if they can be twin rooms typically. Um, but the property itself is it is 95% the same, maybe 90% the same, but it's just how you dress it and market it. And that's where really knowing the audience of, okay, we're we going into we go after leisure people versus going after businesses um, is knowing that difference. And, and yeah, if you're in a seaside town, there's probably not many big offices, big companies, big corporate bookings but there still will be people that are traveling away with work and uh, as Sean said maybe staying with their families where they're between moves or they're relocating out of London to more rural locations and they need somewhere for a couple of months so it's just honing in on exactly who you want to to attract um, but the property itself if, if you pick a great property in the first place it's probably going to work regardless. Sean do you have anything to add on that? Uh, yeah. Um, first, uh, Charlotte, let me compliment the fact that you've got Greg and Donna here. This has been super refreshing um, because obviously as like hosts, a lot of us, we, we learn on our own and it's, it's always an honor to sit next to people who know what they're talking about and actually hear them respond to these questions too. So um, I love all of you guys. This has been super fun. Um, my side. Uh, we find that we get different types of travelers through different channels. So we will never go flexible on say Airbnb, right? Uh, because we just know what kind of travelers we get from Airbnb and how we market. And we don't want to risk giving somebody flexible cancellation and then having an Airbnb traveler who can be fickle and just like buck out of their reservation on flexible last minute cause us to have to discount last minute. So um, we will offer flexibility to uh, people who have a higher, you say, social credit score per se when they're working with us, you know, um, because they are worth accommodating their concerns, right? But Airbnb being an OTA where these people don't have any loyalty to you, they may not come back to you, right? That that's like um that is like your free trial kind of customer that you're going to try to recapture them later and build a relationship with them, but you're going to go through more customers that you will never see again than you will customers that you will build relationship with. So discerning where to be flexible. Um, is 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 a profitable it's a, it's a profit generating it like your profit swings on who you're flexible with and who you're not and so that's that's probably the main thing I, I want to add to that um, and on Greg's point of having multiple listings and a b like not just a b testing but having an a b approach to the same accommodation um, you can also play with your uh, cancellation policies with those because you could have a listing that is a higher price higher premium the design is to get just a big weekend booking and you don't give a refund to that guest because they did compromise your calendar um, and they can afford it, right? Where you might then have a business traveler one that really doesn't appeal to the, the, the leisure travel person. Um, and if they book on that representation of the listing, that might have a moderate cancellation policy instead of a strict one um, because of the type of person. So you can have your listings you know, generate like a different split of like who's looking at what for why and which ones have different price incentives? Because one 
you know, might give an incentive for a monthly stay where the other one really doesn't. And those that the booking behavior get, like it creates a split. And so you can have different cancellation policies if you can predict who's accessing which instance of your accommodation across channels or even on the same channel. Yeah, and Sean, I, I couldn't agree more. And we're the same, as strict as we can possibly be on Airbnb um, and more flexible on, on other channels, um, probably less flexible on booking.com, but um, th that's another one alongside Airbnb. And the other thing that I agree with the pricing is um, we, we intentionally inflate our price in the long term because we don't want widow weekend bookings because then that will stop a profitable monthly or weekly stay that's seven nights a week but it could be they could be looking for a month and you've got a weekend in the middle that's that's booked. So we we encourage like inflating them far out to, to avoid odd weekends where we know we're, we're not in that season. Um, and then we'll pick up them two or three weeks before once we get into the summer if we're still available. Yeah, so um, to make this kind of a conversation here, um, I have a bunch of students that I teach. Pricing strategy is probably one of my favorite things. And so in my, I've got a pricing course um, the way that we have people look at this is if you end up with unbooked days because somebody books a weekend, right? They're only utilizing part of your calendar. You have to attribute the loss of the unbooked day against the profit of your weekend booking and average that out. Where if you've got a seven day stay, right? Where somebody comes in and leaves Monday to Monday, then you have perfect occupancy for that week. And even if you collected 20% off for a week long stay, all seven days were booked that is $800 at the end of the week. But if you book for $200 a night on the weekend, that's $400. And then you've got these with these white bars of unoccupied space where you have to, you have to sell those off at $50 a night or something. And you get four of those nights booked off. Well, not only do you have two cleanings that have to get done, which increases your operating costs, but then you also only made 600 in revenue instead of the 800 in revenue that you would have gotten because you were able to get, you know, say, almost $100, maybe even just over $100 a night on your weekdays on a weekly stay where you had to slash them on the weekdays. So um, how you choose your pricing strategy should be towards top end total end of month revenue. And sometimes you have to protect your calendar from weekend stays. That's absolutely the truth. Yep, couldn't agree more, Sean. No, thank you so much for that. That exactly almost perfect. Um, I think as a leisure host as well, yeah, we noticed that, you know, a lot of our book weekends are already booked up and then we have these horrible Monday to Thursday gaps and selling them are so difficult as for a leisure guest as well because these people are at work. So I think to finish us off, guys, um, please, um, if you have viewers, if you have any questions, please do pop them in while we've got this fantastic panelist here with us today. Um, I think that the final question is, uh, if you had to give a new person who may not be in service accommodation or maybe a leisure host, what would be your top three tips to get them going off and setting them off into this new market of business and corporate? I'll go last because I've got like a thousand tips. <laughs> Amazing. Love it. I would, I'll probably have the least amount of tips because I'm a leisure accommodation manager. <laughs> so if, you know, I'll chip in at the end of it if I feel like I've missed anything. All right. So I guess everyone's volunteered me to go first. So thanks, Sean. Thanks, Donna. Um, I'll try and keep it to three. Number one is definitely know your audience. Um, and I mean that in every single way. It's, it's their booking behaviours, the type of people uh, similar to Sean said on pricing, not all business bookers are like created even. So really knowing which ones are going to be long-term, highly profitable, repeat bookers, value a direct relationship, value partnership, really understanding these things is like, is number one. Um, and it's not probably the person that's like on the shop floor or working on the site or um, like turning up to the job. It's not that person. So really understanding what motivates them and, and how they, they typically buy. And then once you get one loving them um, and valuing that relationship, because it'll be worth 10, 20, maybe even 50 leisure bookings. Um, so like really, really understanding that person. Um, the second one is understanding um, how you can optimize your property around it. So, so as I said, the, the amenities are what they are. 
um, the, the property is what it is, but making sure that your marketing is all built around that audience. So knowing the audience and what drives them, um, then you can be really clear with how you're marketing towards them. So locations to site, access, parking, basic amenities, um, even the wording, if you're looking at something like Airbnb, if you're talking about experience and rural walks and greenery, that's not going to be the target audience you're aiming at. So really making sure that your you're like whole listing presence where on the channels you, you want to focus on for business um, is built around that. Uh, and then the third piece is probably being brave to try something different when it comes to how you run promotions, how you run pricing and, and how you really attract people. Because I, I see lots of people online really excited with a highly profitable weekend booking but I know, back to Sean's point, I know they're going to struggle um, on the Monday to Friday. Uh, and at the minute, we're, let's say, holding tight to say we're willing to take um, less certainty in the long term on some of our units. But knowing that that's going to pay off when we get into the season where businesses are going to need booking um, and everyone else has got odd weekends and odd days and odd, odd weeks booked up, that they're not going to be able to accommodate companies that need three months accommodation for 20 people um so, so we're making sure that we're we're priced appropriately that it, it's worth the risk but we we have enough availability that we know we're going to be well positioned when things open so don't be scared if you're not booking up now months in advance um, and you're not seeing all of these weekend staycations it just means that that's not the audience you're prioritizing um so be like focused at, at doubling down on that because business booking isn't going to be lower demand in the summer than it is now um and everyone else is going to have blocks in their calendar so just be really focused as to who you're trying to attract and why and that's my three thank you so much sean donna down to you now donna do you want to throw some in before yeah I yeah i can start? just i don't have a lot just really about it'd be more around your online presence um from where we, we'd be coming from, from our platforms, is just really to ensure that your property is being displayed correctly. So when it comes to photographs and location, you know, highlighting your proximity to, if there's a known corporate area, you're in a known corporate hub, just highlighting how close you are to, you know, places that are of are in demand to, to a business guest. Um, I'd say really be clear about your check-in, check-out, process um, and the contact details what we see there'd be a lot of kind of if, if there is going to be negative feedback for a property it tends to be around that area um, that they couldn't get in touch with somebody at the property that the person wasn't there at the time they said they would be to let them in so I suppose just be clear about the details and and then stick to them and be consistent really um, other than that yeah just you know target your audience and know your audience as Greg said I completely echo his three points. I'm such an echoer today. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Donna. No worries. We can all echo away. Sean, I'm excited for yours. I have seen that you've shared um, a link to your YouTube. So, as you can only give three, <laughs> but do share, please. Thank you. Absolutely. And some of these actually are going to be fresh. They're not on that. The, I made that video a while ago. So your question is unique, I think. Um, first off, guys, um, you are an accommodation business, right? So all of you who have property should be thinking like a business. And I know this industry has got a low barrier to entry where you can get in with your own apartment, your own house. You can start without really knowing a lot about business and succeed. But you need to change your mindset. Um, so first, you need to know your channels. Um, like we just talked about Airbnb, we're staying strict on Airbnb or booking.com. And that's something that comes from knowing the channel. Um, where if with VRBO or Expedia, because I think Expedia is like a VRBO home away product, um, that that will change. Or if we have direct bookings or return customers, how we're acquiring our customers will change um, like how, we, how we try to generate, like how we try to control booking behavior, terms of service and all the other stuff. Um, and to evolve from just knowing your channels, you really need to know the tools that are available to you. So. Um, for example, Airbnb does weekday pricing and then weekend pricing. And if you have enough listings, they give you like multi-day discounts, like as sort of a two-day or three-day discount. Where with VRBO, you don't get to do three-day discounts, but they allow you to price per day of the week, which means that on a Thursday or a Sunday, you can have a slightly higher price than Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 
where those days tend to be more popular in some markets. So you might want to increase your Friday, Saturday prices, but then also slightly increase your Sunday price and not have it the same price as Monday. So VRBO gives you a better, um, I guess, spread, for example. Um, you also get things like, uh, you know, the market minder information. VRBO does a really good job of giving you insights for your market, knowing those tools that are available to you and starting tweaking those levers um, to get the results you want. Um, you can't tweak those levers if you don't know what they do. Um, so knowing your channels and the tools that are available to you, even with your, like your channel managers, um, uh, you can automate your pricing and stuff like that with a channel manager like Zebu, for example, you can do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and if you don't know what it does, how are you going to run your business with it? Right. And you're, you're obviously like getting these tools for a reason. Um, so there's a, an adage that we teach new hosts all the time. Um, if you don't show it in the photos, they won't know it. So all these amenities that you're using to stay competitive in the market, you're trying to get business travelers by showing that, like for example, one in three travelers, they prefer decaf coffee or tea as opposed to regular caffeinated coffee. You can have that, but if you don't show a photo of your coffee station with the regular coffee, decaf and tea available in your coffee station, they won't know that you have that option, right? So you should be taking photos of these things that you are doing that you're the reason why you're doing them is to increase bookings or to book a different type of traveler and if it's not in your photos you're not getting like full efficacy of these investments that you're making so put everything in your photos and to greg's point about like the future not knowing like what may come and being scared about bookings months from now and not being afraid the best way to not be afraid is to get data um, and there's lots of ways that you can get data and get market insights. And like we've just talked about, the lead time on bookings has gone down, where instead of people booking months in advance, they're booking weeks or days in advance right now. That will change one day. But as you get, if you keep control of having a good flow of data, whether you use like the free version of Wheelhouse or Price Labs, or you're keeping an eye on VRBO's market minder, or you're looking at like, um, like travel boards that have to do with your area or like, like hotel and flight costs and stuff and keeping a look at like what future data projects, you can start making decisions um, on how to treat the next month, right? Because you want to be ready to pivot. That's going to be one of the biggest things that's going to be in your best interest is if you're in a, like in a low market where you've got to be scrappy and fight to fill up your calendar and, you know, wheel and deal, but there's going to be a point where it turns the corner and it can turn the corner fast where you can start to really collect a premium again. Data will tell you um, that you have a shot at collecting a premium on your property and you want to be ready for that um, by letting the data happen. Um, uh, I will say, like shameless plug, my YouTube channel's got like 300 plus videos on how to do this. Um, so just go to the Airbnb automated YouTube channel and, and spend 10, 20 hours learning every little detail of how to run an accommodations business. Um, and that would probably be my third tip, obviously. So um, thank you guys for letting me um, soapbox for a second. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sean. No shameless plug, plugs are fine here. Um, so before we slowly finish off and answer the questions that we've got in there is um, thank you for all for being here. Uh, feedback wise, we would love to hear it. So we have just uh, popped a link in uh, the chat box. If you could fill it out for any feedback and so we know how we can make these better for you next time. Um, so we have an amazing question from Jerry. So please, panelists, who, whoever fancies it, go for it. The question is, I would like to get any help on getting long-term bookings. So how would Jerry get long-term bookings? And I assume this is from a contract point of view or corporate or business traveler. Um, and I think it stated Jerry was in Blackpool, wasn't it? Yes, Blackpool. indeed he is. He is, yeah. So beyond everything that's already been been discussed, Jerry, in terms of like really optimizing your listings around targeting business bookers um, in the area, it is worth doing, and, and Sean mentioned earlier, it's worth just going around the sites. There, there's probably five to 10 sites within 10 minutes that if you just drive around, you'll find someone and have a conversation. And if it's only one or two properties you're trying to fill you may get that on the first visit it may be on like the fifth visit to the fifth site but like do everything online around the the key channels um and then from there then start to get creative how you can find them as well we we find quite a lot with um facebook marketplace is an undertaxed channel um we get some through 
um, th through open rent, we get some through Gumtree. So really thinking outside the box, because what, what we found through through all of the pandemic is people that are proactive in thinking creatively where they can get bookings have been the ones that have managed to like find bookings that are profitable in, in like different niches and different avatars. So they would be like the three ways, get the listings right online, make sure you're, you're listing. If you're looking at objectively, um, you're not focused on Blackpool leisure. You're not focused on the staycation market, which will be what would probably be your traditional market. Um, really focus on, on changing your listings and then visit the sites and then look at the alternative channels. Um, Cause we've found loads of people that are moving house and broken chains um, unable to return home for, for lots of different reasons. Um, so that, that's another way of long-term bookings, albeit potentially not business. Um, yeah, I would just go through those steps, just spend the morning on it. So I'm not in the UK, so I don't think I have a, a lot of insights you know, for UK specific, but I'm gonna try to open your mind a little bit here um, because there are so many things that you can do um, to get bookings. Um, first off, you can ask for referrals. Ask your old guests to come back. Get into all the channels you've ever used that have bookings and reach back out and ask if they plan on coming back to Blackpool um, or if they know anybody. Then if you want to be super sneaky, let me give you a little black hat one. If you have an iPhone that has AirDrop, make a, like make a flyer, like make a brochure that says like, hey, monthly specials, and, you know, add, like have a really good, like, like really cool photos and stuff. And then go sit at the lobby of the biggest hotels that are your competitors nearby where you are and keep your airdrop open on that photo and anybody that walks by just ping them that that photo and just airdrop every single person that goes through that that hotel that has their airdrop open send them that photo and so now you're flyering people into their phones without their permission but this is an example of how you can use guerrilla marketing and just really crazy i'll do whatever it takes to fill up my property because in the uk um, I've sp spoken to hosts and like, like Mark Simpson from Boostly, um, people are like, it's like people are fighting for their very survival in this market with how little revenue was available for a while. You find ways to stay full, right? If you want it bad enough, you will get it done. And so get creative and don't ask like, is this normal? Would somebody else do this? Am I going to get laughed at for this form of marketing? If you're getting laughed at for a form of marketing, you're probably doing something right because people are too comfortable. So that airdrop example is just one of those like, Hairbrained ideas that just could work. So think about other ideas that just might work, but you're looking for relevant leads, really. That's really what you really wanna focus on is how can I find relevant audience for the product that I'm serving to people? Amazing, thank you, Sean. Um, I'm gonna to go to Emma's question next, um, it's, as it's a good one. We, with a huge proportion of the workforce working from home, do you think there'll be a growth uh, in the market for business groups traveling for team bonding? Are we asking because you have a property that's available for team bonding, right, is my first question. Um, because if the answer is yes, um, I think you're thinking too narrow, right? If you've got a retreat available property, you now have more marketing opportunity. Like we're talking about getting a little bit wild. Um, there are so many online expert influencer people doing sales and stuff and trying to sell mastermind tickets and retreat events. Um, like for me, if I was going to do a mastermind, I have to choose where I want to hold it at. And if like somebody like this, was at the front of the line saying, hey, I've got this property, you should plan a mastermind here. If they were collaborating with me going, hey, you could use my property to do a retreat or a bonding event, I would likely want to use them. So um, if I was a person with a product that fit a very specific audience, I would start upping my content strategy to promote for that special use. And I wouldn't just do team bonding, which you can call, you can call companies and say, hey, we've got this event space available. Have you thought about doing a, a retreat? I would get on social media with any influencers that might be trying to do like meetups in spaces too. There's a product here in the States called Peer Space um, that might become popular um, in other countries where you don't actually rent the property overnight even, you just rent it during the day for like photo shoots and video stuff and events and meetings and stuff like that. So um, think bigger than just company retreats if you've got a property available for that. Um, the answer is yes, but yes plus open, open that can of worms all the way.
Thank you. Uh, this is a really good question because uh, I, I have this as well. We have a four night minimum all week, assuming contractors want at least four nights. So um, yeah, is having that four night minimum in there good or is it bad? Are we restricting the contractors coming in or? I would say you're not restricting it at all until you get to a Tuesday. And then you're basically saying you can't get booked. Um, so our vast majority are our four nights, weekdays. That's our minimum. Um, but we do, if we get to a Tuesday and we have a vacancy, we'll adjust it for that week for a three. And equally, if it's a bank holiday, we'll adjust it to be three. Um, and I think lots of operators miss that. If you're using like dynamic pricing and you set your, your winner minimum weekdays, um, they are the ones you'll normally miss. It'll be like, it'll get to a Tuesday and you're not booked, but you won't even be visible for anything that's a Tuesday to Friday because of your four night minimum. Um, so that's something that our, our defaults are saying four nights, but then you just need to be on top of it with either Mondays where you're not booked or like a bank holiday coming up in a couple of weeks in the UK. Um, or is it even next week? Coming up over like with, with Black Friday and um, yeah, Easter weekend, basically you'll want to adjust that down to a three nine minimum otherwise you'll find both of those weeks empty unless you get someone booking for all of it so um to not a typical to not completely disagree um but to open up like another one of those like know your tools kind of topics on airbnb i'd recommend not having a minimum but i would manipulate my price to essentially create a minimum conditionally so on Airbnb, if you have three or more listings, you can have what's called Pro Tools, which includes a, uh, a short-term two, three, four-day long discounts, and you have a multi-calendar with like rule sets and stuff. What you can do is you can double your price from what you normally would charge and then give a three-day discount of 50% off, right? Or a three-day discount of 30% uh, off and then a four-day discount of 50% off. And that brings you right back to the price you wanted for four days or longer. So if somebody's going to search on Airbnb, you don't get knocked out of search anymore because that's one of the big things for Airbnb is they're, they're what's called an interest algorithm. And so the number of views you get um, determines your ranking. And it's one of the factors in your ranking. So you don't want to not show up in search. If somebody's searching for two days, you still want to show up in the real. So that way they click on you and let curiosity drive that. They probably won't book you, but that actually doesn't hurt you. You just wanted to click. So um, by not having a 40 minimum on Airbnb, there's that. And then you can actually hack this then where you can create a rule set or you can even build it right into the listing where you have like last minute discounts. So um, if you do double your price, um, but you want to make it where somebody has a last minute discount back down to normal for a shorter stay, you can actually automate in a day before, two days before you can get that 50% off. So that way now people are able to um, like use your, you're now unrestricting longer term stays by automating a price drop once you hit what you can consider to be like your critical threshold for last minute bookings. Mute, mute. Okay, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, really helpful there. Um, also, just guys who are still on, uh, Greg's just popped in a marketing to contractors. So you go check that out for some extra bits and bobs. And I think we have one final question, which is um, Ralph, and it sounds like he's got more of a leisure property. How would you envis envisage getting business bookings or longer terms in Nice, France? Um, I don't want to sound like repeating, but I think it's very different or similar, sorry, to, um, to Jerry's question about Blackpool. It's primarily a leisure tourism or high leisure tourist peak season summer season type location um so i would be looking at uh, things you mentioned for jerry and there are also the use cases where people would typically need to stay for longer so relocation with work um broken chain between moving and these type of things so i would look at them in addition to the the, the things we've already discussed around um optimizing listings towards towards contractors and businesses Yeah, um, the theme of the day here is if you're not getting results, you need to increase your activity. Uh, don't let fear keep you from getting creative. Um, and you can always spy on your competition and find out what they're doing that's working as well. Uh, there's nothing wrong with um, 
try to just chat up local community. Like there's probably groups on Facebook, like local host groups on Facebook and um, different stuff like that. Just casually chat up people and see what they're also doing to get the types of customers that you want. Maybe somebody like whenever somebody's succeeding, right? Whenever they're in a surplus mindset, part of like the human condition is to one brag or two be altruistic and both lead to the same thing, which is them telling you what they're doing. They'll tell you what works because they either want to brag or they want to help you. So ask around, get creative, stay busy, stay hungry. I mean, because if you are a small business, um, your main advantage is that you are willing to fight harder than a bigger business. Bigger businesses are like, well, let's just shut down this part of the company for a while. Like that's too much work, too much chaos. Let's just shut it down. Small companies, you're fighting, you're Spartans. You know, that is really going to be um, what gets you through things like this is your ability to be nimble and fight harder for the resources. Donna, from your perspective as well, as um, considering that maybe Nice would be seen as a leisure, is there anything else that you can add to that? To just, I suppose, know what you're working with with regards to your budget and utilize the channels that are available to you when it comes to marketing and advertising your property. You know, so there could be, you could be signed up to three, four, five, ten different channels and they're not producing, they're not producing for a reason. So kind of approach it with your customer hat on, um, you know, know the type of property you're selling and where it would be marketed correctly, what type of channel is going to market it to the audience that you want to attract at the moment. I think we, a lot of places will take any kind of audience um, just with the environment we find ourselves in, but there's no point in, um, you know, too, too many cooks spoil the broth, as they say, pick, you know, the channels that are going to work for you and work well. Um, and, you know, just work with your the budget that you have, your advertising budget, I would, that would be my advice. Beautiful, well, thank you so much. And I think that is it. If there's any more questions, you've got a couple of seconds to put them in. But other than that, if we're, that's it. Thank you so much for turning up, Sean, Donna and Greg. It's been great to have you. I'm sure everybody, found your content and your knowledge and experience on this really helpful. I know that I have done that. I found that for you from you guys as being a small operator. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I guess that is it for now. Thanks guys. Um, is Donna, Greg, is there any ways that people can keep in touch with you um, if they want to keep in touch with you? Absolutely. Um, my name, Donna O'Sullivan, on the screen. You can find me on LinkedIn. And I'll happily reach out and chat with anybody if they have any questions about anything. Yep, same. LinkedIn is probably the best place to reach me. Um, LinkedIn or Facebook. Luckily, my name's unusual. Um, probably similar to yours, Sean, where people Google you and it's not too difficult to find. So, um, yeah, happy to connect with anyone that, that wants to talk through anything or um, share any listings that are really struggling with where, where we can help. Super. Um, and aside from my YouTube, uh, I've got my Instagram. It's Airbnb Automated. Um, and I have a link in my Airbnb Automated Instagram that has like a, like a resource for like how to get to my YouTube and all sorts of other places. So it's kind of like a cool intersection of resources for me. So I would recommend Instagram is where you guys start. Just find me, find me there and then send, the, send a message. Why not? Right. And again, thank you, uh, Charlotte, for having us on. No, thank you, guys. Well, there you go. If you need to get in touch with these guys, you know how to. Uh, thank you for all being here. I hope to see you all again, either virtually in real life. Hopefully, I'll be able to go to the States as soon as we're allowed to travel with no fines, of course.